Good evening and welcome to the closing weekend of Contagion's programming. Contagion is Science Gallery Bengaluru's fourth exhibition and first fully online exhibition season. Science Gallery Bengaluru, for those of you who haven't yet had the chance to meet us, is a public institution for research-based engagement. Today's lecture, is a part of a 23 lecture public lecture series supported by the Indian National Science Academy. Today's lecture will be given by Madhav Marathe. His lecture is called Real-Time Contagion Science in the 21st Century, the Role of Data and Computing. Before I introduce Professor Marathe, I will mention the upcoming programs we have in this closing weekend. Tomorrow, we have a guided tour of Edward Jenner's house led by Owen Gower at 5 p.m. It will basically give you a view into early history of vaccination. Tomorrow's closing lecture is Science, Innovation and Society. What have we learned from COVID-19 pandemic? The lecture will be given by Jeremy Farrar, the director of the Wellcome Trust, and that's at 6.30 p.m. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Madhav Marathe, who is a distinguished professor in biocomplexity the Division Director of the Network System Science and Advanced Computing Division at the Biocomplexity Institute and Initiative, and at the same time, a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Virginia. He's a passionate advocate and practitioner of transdisciplinary team science. During his 25 year professional career, he has established and led a number of large transdisciplinary projects and groups. His research interests are in network and data science, computational epidemiology, artificial intelligence, foundations of computing, and high-performance computing. Throughout his career, he has been studying contagion-like phenomena that's, uh, that occur in social and engineered systems. This includes non-infectious diseases, computer viruses, and cascades in social and infrastructure systems. For instance, the division he leads has supported federal and state authorities in their effort to combat epidemics in real time, including the H1N1 pandemic in 2009, the Ebola outbreak in 2014, and most recently, the COVID-19 pandemic. Remember that you can type in your questions in the Q&A box. Do give us your feedback as we proceed. And with that, over to you, Madhav. Uh, Madhav, you're muted. Uh, thank you, Janvi. Uh, such a kind introduction. I want to thank you all for kindly inviting me to give this uh, lecture. I've been looking forward to, to this talk. It's a very different kind of talk, uh, but sounds very exciting. And my kudos to you all for organizing a wonderful, wonderful uh, set of series of talks in, in this meeting. So without further ado, let me start my lecture. Um, as Janavi said, the title of the talk is Real-Time Contagion Science in the 21st Century. And I'm going to focus on the role of data and computing in describing how one could respond and plan for future contagions. So before I, I get into details, let's first even understand what contagion might, uh, you know, the word contagion means. Uh, it's formed out of two smaller words, cont, which means together and tangent, it means to touch. And in general, this term is to use to denote the spread of something. And I use the word something because there's so many different things that people have used contagion for. And in general, the spread happens via interaction between agents. And again, agents need not be just individual people. They could be two uh, animals. They could be an insect and a plant uh, and so on and so forth. And there are multiple examples of, uh, of contagion that people have studied, uh, the most recent ones that you folks might have heard of is the 2007-8 uh, global financial contagion, contagion of products when they you know, go viral, contagion of malware on computer networks and such. So today's talk is going to talk about such contagions and I must uh, acknowledge the team and my, my colleagues uh, at the Biocomplexity Institute, but also my colleagues at other universities and institutions across the world, including folks at the Indian Institute of Science, whom we work very closely with, as well as folks at Persistent Systems in India, and a number of folks in other universities in the US. 
uh, I really acknowledge their help. Much of the work that I'm going to talk about builds on the work that the group has done. So going back to examples of contagions, uh, one particular class of contagions that you all are very familiar with is social contagions, where you see rumors, fads, opinions, emotions spread. Two important examples recently, uh, you know, in recent past, in about last 10 years or so, is the Arab Spring, and then a recent one where uh, you know people in in the U.S. Uh, protested after George Floyd's death. Uh, and as one of the protesters during the Arab Spring said, they use Facebook to set the date, Twitter to share logistics, and YouTube really to connect to people. And that really tells you the power that the, the media had and the way the contagion really took off using social media. Another example of a, of a contagion is a beautiful ex piece of experiment, a really simple experiment that Tom Schelling did back in late 50s. And it was based on a study by Duncan and Duncan in, the, in Chicago, where they noticed over and over again that people uh, of different communities often tend to segregate into, into housings that were separated out. So Schelling actually did a very nice, simple experiment that you all can do uh, using a chessboard, and that's why I bring it up. So what he did was he took a chessboard, I've shown a very small part of it on the right bottom, and you place pennies uh, uh, on, on this chessboard, basically, you, and dimes. And this is how you can place you know, uh, quarter, quarter or some other coins. One coin type might represent one kind of group and other coin will represent other group. So it could be, uh, you know, folks in India, uh, you know, boys and girls, smokers or non-smokers, believers or non-believers, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So these are just variations on the group. You can choose any, any form you want to have might have racial segregation as well. And the idea is that if you place them initially randomly, which means that people are really living essentially together in close quarters, think about edges being the neighbors of a, of, a, of a particular person. And if a particular person sees more neighbors and you can define what more would mean, more neighbors of a different type around him or her, then the person can choose to leave that neighborhood and moves into another neighborhood shown by another block on the chessboard where he or she finds more comfort by what, having enough neighbors of his type, right? So the idea is it's a very simple phenomenon. There's no collective coordination that is going on. Every person feels comfortable in, in around his or her sort of uh, fellow folks uh, who share the same kind of characteristics. And they move if they don't find enough of those neighbors into a community that such neighbors uh, exist. And in the top, you see just two screen snapshots from a, from a project at GMU, uh, where you, if you start with the mixed uh, sort of placement of these individuals on the screen and red and black were the two colors that were chosen. After a number of moves, you start seeing what's called a segregated uh, distribution where the red ones are now in, in re relatively similar neighborhoods and the black one form other neighborhoods. And the fact that Schelling could observe this phenomena by placing simple coins on a chessboard was an amazing. This was something that uh, Schelling got a Turing uh, Nobel Prize for. I'm sorry, I'm used to Turing uh, awards being computer scientists, but the Nobel Prize for in economics uh, with, uh, with others. And the idea he wanted to show was that simple local behaviors, micro behaviors, as he called it, led to macroscopic changes uh, without any global coordination. And this is a form of contagion in some way. Another example of contagion is contagion in physical systems and power grids where you have cascading failures, uh, where we saw one in, in the US in 2003. And you folks, I think, had a fairly massive uh, you know, blackout in India um, in, in, uh, in over the last 15 years. I don't remember the exact date, but it was a rather large outbreak that people studied. So uh, in these contagions, one is interested in studying uh, mechanisms. How do, you know, contagious diseases spread? How does information spread on Twitter? How do people decide to participate in various movements? 
and you want to understand it because all these things have significant impact. For instance, uh, the 1992 Los Angeles riots, which was a contagion of sort, had a billion plus dollars in damage. Uh, healthcare costs just due to obesity, smoking, and drugs, which are viewed to be contagion style processes now, uh, have a huge economic impact. The COVID-19 is, is an example that we will talk a little later. Uh, again, has a large impact on, on the system. And interventions, which means a way to control the dynamics or the macro outcome, as Schelling would call it, uh, using various methods is as a result very, very important. So for instance, you might want to figure out how to minimize the spread of epidemics or information of certain kind of rumors, how to increase the probability that a particular marketing campaign goes viral, how to spread safety tip tips among drug users, how to encourage healthy youth behavior, how to foster democracy. These are all interventions that allow you to construct a particular form of macro behavior of the, of the system uh, through you know, in, in, interventions which are done strategically. So contagions are best represented in my mind, of course, uh, through a concept called networks. You've heard earlier talks, uh, Damon Santola gave a very nice talk. Uh, Gautam Menon also talked about networks, as I remember, uh, where you use networks to really study this. And, and, and Damon Santola's talk really talked about simple versus complex contagions. And I'm trying to show here a similar idea, uh, again, through a figure, where there is a single per individual shown in red. Uh, influence uh, on this individual can be felt by his or her neighbors defined by edges. Either they are dotted edges or dashed edges. And that just refers to how strong the influence might be. And the colors represent different kinds of influences. So an individual who is a neighbor of other individuals, a neighbor as in a, in a network, would get influenced or affected by the contagion through these interactions. And that's how you represent contagion in, 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 a, in, a, in a mathematical form. So today's lecture is gonna focus on disease contagion. It's a central topic of the entire series. And of course, uh, with the COVID pandemic uh, that we've all uh, witnessed and essentially being a part of, it's a, it's a topic that, that's a perfect topic to study further. So of course, pandemics are not new. Uh, they've been uh, as old as human history. Uh, I'm, I wanted to highlight cholera pandemics, which really had a tremendous impact on the world in, in a, you know, late 19th century. Uh, in fact, the numbers here show you the impact just in, in uh, UK, where in about three rounds of this Asiatic cholera, as it was called, uh, that reached uh, the British Isles, uh, killed a, a large population in England and Wales. And the last pandemic in 1854 killed 30,000 people just in London alone. Uh, even today, after so many years with, with amazing interventions through clean water, sanitation, we still had close to a million cases in 2019 and close to 2,000 deaths in 31 different countries, as WHO has reported. Uh, so it, after almost 200 plus years, this continues to be a scourge on the human society, continues to affect us in a, in a rather large way although we have certainly reduced the mortality rate significantly over time. Uh, what we are gonna focus a little bit today is the COVID-19 pandemic, the one that started approximately in, in uh, December, January, depending on how you count it, and has spread throughout the world. Uh, we have built a dashboard, uh, which hopefully I can show you a little bit about, and uh, it'll require me to a start, stop the share screen and share a completely different screen if it, if you allow me, um, so just 30 seconds. Because you'll start seeing a very interesting uh, picture play out. So this is a dashboard that our group has built. Darwin led this effort, excellent work uh, along with persistent systems. And you can actually see how the pandemic evolved in time. This, this is a real-time situation assessment tool 
Johns Hopkins University has built a very similar tool as well, uh, very nicely done work. But you can start seeing how the pandemic spread through the, through the world. And uh, this is shown in states getting colors. The colors rep represent number of active cases. And to improve time, I'll speed it up a little bit. As it spreads, the, the timeline tells you the, the time that it, it spreads through the population. The numbers on the left tell you the count, the total count. And you can see that number of deaths going up. They've reached close to 3.3 million individuals now in the, in the world as confirmed deaths. So a significant number by any means. And we'll come back to this, this again uh, in, a, in a minute. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen again. Um, yes, we can. Okay. So today, what I will do is I'll focus on the role of information technology to support real-time epidemic science or pandemic science. And the concept I'm going to try and drive towards is a concept of P-cubed analytics. And the three P's here stand for pervasive, personalized, and precision. Pervasive in that we want to build analytical tools or systems that a decision maker or an individual can use at any place, at any time, and using any device. It's personalized, which means if I want to make specific decision about whether to send my children to school versus Janavi wants to make a decision about going to shop on a particular evening, she should be able to do that with the local information she's given. And it should be precise. It should reflect the current context and the situation on the ground. So that's the that's three words. You might want to remember these as we go through the lecture. And hopefully by the end of the lecture, you will see that the tools that we are starting to make are driving these, these uh, I, ICT technologies to produce such kinds of tools. Uh, so what sort of mathematical system, you know, formalizations can we have to study epidemics? One that has been used for over 100 years now is called a compartmental mass action model. Here, you take uh, the society and break it down into, in this particular example given, three compartments, susceptible, infected, and recovered. And you essentially write a set of what mathematicians would call differential equations. You tell what is the rate of change of number of individuals in each compartment over time. Now this model was, this, this form of mathematical reasoning was developed very early on in early 1900s, as I said, very successful, continues to be used very, very effectively even today after 100 years, because it's very simple, very cleanly uh, understandable and transparent, and has been studied now for 100 years. So a lot of tools are available. The reason this was built and was motivated was people's understanding of physical systems. They, you know, in, in some ways, this particular formalism can be used to study molecules in a, in a box or chemical reactions or biological reactions, because the concept of susceptible individual and recovered are just abstractions of three different classes and interaction between them, uh, which really makes the, the issue very simple and easy to compute, but sometimes, uh, does not have the details that one would like. And today's lecture, I'm going to focus on a slightly different class of mathematical models uh, called models based on networks. And the idea here is if you want to understand contagion or spread of infectious diseases or other contagions, then you need two things. One, you need to understand individual agents or entities. You need to understand, second, how they're connected. And then you need to understand how the interaction leads to the spread. If you have these three ingredients that we discussed earlier, then you can represent mathematically the contagion on a network. Why are networks interesting and important? Well, we think that networks actually capture the inherent heterogeneity that the society has. The abstraction that every individual looks identical, which is how the SIR models have it, is perhaps mathematically easy, and it in fact turns out to be useful oftentimes, but then loses the details that are quite important. For instance, some people might be living in one part of the town versus another part of the town. They might interact with more people or less people. Uh, you know, in, in Mumbai, there might be richer neighborhoods and poorer neighborhoods, and their interaction patterns might be different. 
people might be immunocompromised or not immunocompromised. All these attributes of individuals and interactions just are not easily representable in the differential equation based model. Uh, the network model allows you to do that. Let me go through it in a very simple form. Here you have a network of uh, seven agents. You know, think about them as people living in a small household. And initially the node colored red is infected. And think about this particular abstract disease where the person is going to get recovered in one, one day. And I'll only introduce one mathematical concept. Hopefully everybody will understand it. The way the disease spreads in this is this red node interacts with its neighbors, in this case, neighbor V1, V2, and V3, and tries to infect them. And the infection, because we do not understand all the details, is represented as a, as a probabilistic move. So V0 can infect the agent V1 with some chance, here chance of half, similarly V2 and V3. And what happens with this simple model is you get an evolution of, of the disease in time. Initially, V0 is infected. V0 infects V1 and V2 in the next time step and recovers. V1 and V2 together infect V4 and V6, but they are not able to infect V5 because there's a chance here that it might happen. And then finally, V4, V6 recover, but V6 ends up infecting V3 and then the last step V3 recovers. So two important concepts that get used. One is the concept of epidemic curve that's shown here in the, in the middle panel at the bottom. And this tells you the number of infections per day. So in, on day zero, you have one infection. Day two, day one and day two, you have two infections each. And then uh, day three, uh, we have one infection back again and then day four, zero infections. So this is called an epidemic curve. It tells you the rise and fall of the epidemic as it moves to the population. Effectively, the macro structure that Schelling referred to. And on the right is what's called a transmission tree. It gives you details of how the epidemic might have spread. It might have spread for, from a person in the family, the head of the family, he or she might have given it to their, to their partner. They might have given it to the two children. The children might have given it to one of the grandparents, the grandparent gave it to another grandparent and so on and so forth. This, this structure here tells you how the disease spreads. And it's a very powerful way to visualize the disease as you can imagine. So how do we study this in, in, our, in our work? There are three very simple, easy to describe steps. Of course, each of them is a, uh, is in a research program in itself. But what you do is you first build a digital twin of a city that you want to study the epidemic or pandemic in. Second, you build simulations, basically computer systems that effectively uh, encode the interactions on a computer and then see how those interactions play out on the computer as if they were playing out in the real world. And then you use analytics and com you know, computer codes to try and understand and solve problems that uh, uh, epidemiologists or decision maker might care about forecasting, studying different planning scenarios, assigning or re allocating resources such as vaccines and influences of where the disease might have come from. So let's go through these steps because I think they are quite interesting. The first step is to create a digital twin. The term digital twin that has been used recently uh, refers to the concept that you want to create, if you want to have a digital twin of an object, then you want to create a essentially a mimic that object's characteristics in a computer. So if I want to study diseases, then a digital twin of a city would be a representation of a city in the computer with all sorts of details that might be relevant to the city. So you might have individuals represented as agents, you might have streets, you might have households, you might have these individuals going and doing things. So think about people who have played games on computer are quite quite comfortable with this concept. And SimCity is one such game where similar representations are built. The difference I would argue here is that SimCity is really about playing a game. Here, the underlying data that drives and builds to make a city uh, should be such that's a realistic representation of the city or a region that we want to study. So we have done this over the last, I would say 25 years, where we've taken all sorts of different data sets from census data that a country has, to travel data, to now data from uh, you know, anonymized and aggregate data from digital phone 
uh, phones to data from commercial uh, location uh, databases, and you create a, a digital twin of a city or a region or a country that you're interested in. And from that, you derive uh, 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 the in, in network that I showed you briefly in the early slide, where there are people and people interact with other people as they move about doing their daily activities in a city. So for instance, I and my family might be at home. So I might have a set of edges with my family uh, till uh, from say night, midnight to eight o'clock in the morning. Then the kids go to school and I drop them and then the edges change. I go to work. So my new edges are with my office mates the edges for my children or interaction edges in my children are with their school friends. Then we come back home after some time. Uh, I might go shopping. I might have new edges formed there. Uh, kids might go to a playground and play with their friends in their neighborhood. All these edges get represented as a part of this process. And over 20 years now, we have actually finally built out what we call a global uh, digital twin. We can represent essentially large portions of the world in this manner. There are a couple of important things to note. First, the nodes or individual agents are synthetic, which means that if I say, take myself as an example, you won't find me in the computer representation, but you'll find somebody like me living on an address roughly similar to mine in the US, right? The idea is that I do not want for privacy and anonymity reasons to build an exact replica because that has different problems to deal with. But statistically, it should represent the kinds of interactions that I am most concerned about when I study epidemics. Uh, this is a very large and interesting computer science question. So for folks who want to discuss this further, we can have a discussion later on in the session that I understand has been organized. You then assign models of disease transmission to every individual. Uh, in computer science, there's a concept of finite state machines. The only thing you need to remember here is that a person might initially be uninfected, might get infected by a neighbor, that the, the, there's a latent period uh, for the disease. They might show up to be infectious after some period of time. They might pass the disease to other folks and they might recover. They might also become asymptomatic uh, and never show, show symptoms for the disease at all. So one way to visualize this this whole thing is through a simple uh, cartoon that I built. There's five people here. They go to these net, uh, locations. So I marked them person with red as people who are infected. And I made copies of them because I want to show them that they went to these locations. The, the nodes in red infect their neighbors here. Uh, the infection is successful in some cases. For instance, some of the nodes get infected, the other nodes don't. Um, just as a matter of chance. And then they head back home at the end of the day. Uh, and that's when the process for a day stops. And this process in the computer continues day after day after day. And that's what allows us to construct the epidemic curve that I talked about. So to see what happens when you run such systems at a scale of a US network, you can see how disease would spread in the entire US. This is a you know, we, we decided to make up a disease just to show, and it tells you how disease would have spread through the network um, across all of US uh, when it would have started some, somewhere in New Mexico in this particular case. It was a particular adenovirus that we were trying to simulate here. What is interesting for me and others as computer scientists is that to build computing technology to do these simulations is really massive and, and, and interesting. These national simulations have 300 million such agents, about 15 billion interactions, uh, 1 trillion interaction, 15 billion edges, you know, neighbors. And on a machine that is available to us at the National Supercomputing Centers with close to 750,000 individual processors connected to form a parallel machine, we can actually make one run of the simulation in about 10 seconds. Initially, it take us 40, 50 hours to do this. So the technology has come a long way. I wanted to show you this as one example of how technology gets used. How can these simulations be used? Well, they can be used for a number of different purposes. You can use it for situation assessment. For instance, you can understand where the disease might currently be, uh, which populations might be infected, 
uh, you might use it to forecast where the disease might go. You might forecast the number of new cases, uh, number of hospitalizations, infections. You might use it to study different interventions and their efficacy. For instance, vaccination might be an intervention you might want to study, or you might want to study the efficacy of contact tracing. You might want to study the efficacy of say various lockdown measures that government might put in place. Another use of such simulations is to study individual risk going back to the PQ analysis. I think it's feasible now that with the data that phones have, uh, you can be provided an individual risk. You might be told, you know, given your mobility patterns and given your uh, you know, places where you go, where maybe the level of epidemic is such, you might have a higher or lower risk of contracting the disease in the next few days. And this I think has become really feasible in the next few years. Uh, inverse problems can be solved as well, which means I see where the current disease is, but I want to know who the person might have been who started the disease. And in H1N1, they traced it down to a single person in Mexico where the disease started. It's quite amazing that people can do that using computer models. And then you can study economic impact. You can study the impact of the disease itself to hospitalizations, mortality, treatment, but you can also study larger impact in the society because of various closures, because of loss in productivity and such. And we have done that for COVID in the last few years. Another interesting aspect of using computing and ICT technologies to do this is this new emerging concept of hybrid clouds. All of you must have certainly heard about cloud computing by now, where you, you do the computing with a thin client, as they call it, on your small machine. But all the work really is being done at data centers that you don't even know where they are placed. Uh, many of your credit card transactions, uh, when you pay electricity bills, all this work is being done in the background and it's done in data centers as a part of cloud computing. When you do bank transactions, the same thing happens. Now, when we want to run such large simulations, oftentimes the data centers or computing centers we need to use are, have to be massive parallel machines. So we have a big parallel machine here with 2000 odd cores called Rivana. But even that was not sufficient to provide real time support to decision maker as COVID was evolving. So we worked with folks at Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center and the NSF Exceeds project. And I want to thank Rick, Sean and John Towns for being so supportive of this project where we were allowed to access supercomputing uh, system in Pittsburgh, which has 20,000 processors hooked together to give a parallel machine. And every evening we got access to the machine all for ourselves. And this lasted for about two to three months. And then we continue to get access now on a prioritized basis. So what we had to do was we had to do computations during the day on our machine, set the computations up, ship the computation seamlessly on the big machine on the other side, finish the computations in the night and bring the computations back, the results back on our machine, finish the analysis and then provide it to the decision maker. The cycle turned out to be very, very important during the outbreak response time. What sort of support did we provide? Well, our group is a lead uh, modeling group for our state, the Commonwealth of Virginia and the US. And we provide them weekly reports to significant interactions with the state uh, public health officials. Uh, we have about three to four uh, briefings and meetings with them every week. And those meetings then tell us what problems we want to work for the next week. And we provide this information. You can go to the website that I've shown here. Uh, the website tells you uh, the kinds of analysis we do. Um, we provide them situation assessment reports, for instance, uh, which county in the state might be uh, you know, worse shape than other counties, whether the disease might be starting to slow down in one county versus other. We provide them literature survey because so many publications are coming out and they would like to know different uh, things about published work. For instance, recently there's been a lot of interest in mental health issues related to COVID. Uh, this is an issue I want to bring up because even though the pandemic might, you know, hopefully be overcome in the next year or so in the world, at least reduced to a small number of cases. I think long-term health impacts, including mental health 
including uh, you know in you know the, the damage that has been done to people's lungs and so on and so forth is going to continue with for a long time and uh, the people have done very interesting studies to understand this we also provide them projections meaning we tell them what might happen if they change certain decisions for instance they might decide to open up shopping centers in one county and keep it closed in another county they might decide to open schools partially they might decide to uh, close down certain facilities after midnight all these decisions that you all heard of in india and elsewhere are the decisions we try and take into account and say what if you take the following decisions where do you think the the infection would be in in 15 days one month and uh, future and of course these are just projections which means by by very definition of them they are not likely to be exactly what happens right because every week we would refine it based on changes that you see in in the in the society we also provide them narrative summaries of it uh, so here is one example of early work we had done uh, if it plays i will uh, show you uh, we had done a study that was published in nature um in uh, about a, a bio bio event where the pandemic might have been caused by a deliberate release of a pathogenic agent in the system and this this form is not something that people don't know about people are concerned about this especially with synthetic biology starting to become important there's a concern that either by accident or potentially even by an adversary somebody might release a pathogen that might be harmful so we studied how uh, uh, smallpox if released in the population uh, in the us would have effects and how you could contain it by targeted vaccinations and quarantine so left panel shows the the spread of smallpox in in a, in a city it's a it's a computer model this is completely uh, you know abstract um, you know it's not real but it's a what if scenario and on the right shows you how vaccinations could have controlled this with along with quarantine um we have also built dashboards and others have done it too one of the dashboards as i pointed out is the work done by john hopkins university i have already shown you the dashboard on the top left corner there are a couple of other dashboards i wanted to bring to your attention one is the medical resource demand dashboard that's online and available you can go to the site what it provides uh policy makers and individuals in the us is a sense for how uh how the medical resources uh would would be in terms of availability in the country in the, and this is largely focused on on building uh, on on uh, on beds ventilators and similar uh, equipment that is needed for hospitalized patients and this is done for all the us at the scale of what's called a um you know area which is called the hospital system area so virginia has for us seven such hospital areas that we deal with uh, and i think such a tool would be very valuable in the context of say india right where you can actually see whether you are going to overshoot the 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 the, the capacity of the medical system and we saw that there was real challenging times in in month of april in india uh, this would help people make decisions much better the left bottom is a tool that we built with stanford uh with michael bernstein and we tried to capture through through crowdsourcing various interventions that were being put in place in counties in the us there are other groups who have done a very nice job with it and we have right now put this particular dashboard on hold but we got some very interesting data out of it and the last dashboard i want to highlight is called the mobility impact dashboard this was done again with a group at stanford yuri leskovic and sarina chang and our group worked on this along with persistent to build a dashboard which tells decision makers in uh, in this case virginia what would happen if various points of interest or types of you know points of interest were closed or open at different levels how much do you see would see a drop and this was a question people were very interested in right because of course a a, a sledgehammer way to do it is to shut down everything for a long period it's a fair strategy of course but you might say you know what much of the transmissions might be happening in in certain kind of restaurants and maybe bars so let's close them for a period of time rather than shutting down everything or maybe let's shut down swimming pools because that's where maybe uh, you know 
things uh, happen more in terms of interactions and spread of the disease. So this tool actually gives decision makers, every week this gets updated and tells them if they take a decision this week, the impact of it for the next few weeks. And again, as society adapts, the numbers keep changing. So I'll give you one last example and then we'll close in the interest of time. A recent paper that we published uh, was to study how could we allocate vaccines based on use of this digital twin. And I want to outline this particular result because I think it holds a lot of promise for potentially controlling uh, the spread of COVID in, in certainly LMICs, the lower middle income countries, uh, uh, you know, India being an example, Vietnam, Brazil, uh, and other countries that are really going through a very hard time right now. So our findings is that you can actually, instead of giving it based purely on age, which is something we studied, but if you also target it, you give these vaccination, vaccines to individuals who can be called as social butterflies, people who interact with many other people, then we believe that our models show that you can actually get a far bigger impact in terms of reduction of infections, hospitalization, and deaths. We did this study in our state, but the results are certainly applicable in other places as well. The magnitude might be slightly different, although I think the magnitude in the context of India might actually be even larger given the density of the population. So what it's telling you is if you have very limited resources, then perhaps, and this is a societal decision to make, this is just a modeling work that we've done, but the government and the people together have to decide whether this is a strategy that they apply. But if you give it to individuals who interact with a lot more individuals, then perhaps the strategy would actually be uh, helpful. And we have shown this in the computer simulation. It's actually borne out recently in a paper that was published out of Finland where they gave vaccines to what, an older person at home and a adult, younger adult at home because that adult went out. So it's a combination of these strategies and it shows that indeed you can actually reduce the infections uh, quite a bit by that strategy. I want to argue for the strategy because I think in India there is still at least I would say end of this year, probably more when vaccines are going to be available to everyone. And we want to try and control the disease so that people can get back to normal daily activities. Of course, there are two challenges. One challenge might be that some people might feel this is not fair to everyone. Some people might decide to become social butterflies as a result. The other challenge is how do you estimate that you have a lot of interactions? So there are two ways to estimate uh, and approximate estimates turn out to be good enough. One is through using apps like uh, Arogya Setu of course, everybody doesn't use that in India, but certain, certain countries have very good use of these digital contact tracing apps and they can be modified in a very simple manner to try and, and sort of assess somebody's social number of social interactions. There are other ways to do it by simple questionnaire. You can ask a person when they come to the hospital, uh, you know, how big their family size might be, where all they might visit, what sort of work they do. And our view is that five or six such questions actually provide a very good assessment of the, of the degree of, of a node uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a fairly good, good manner. So the reason such a strategy really works is because vaccine, of course, provide you direct protection, right? A person such as X who gets the vaccine, of course, is protected because of the vaccine. So I will get the vaccine and I'm protected. But what it does is because I am protected and I don't become a carrier or spread of the disease, my neighbors are effectively getting indirect protection. When you give vaccine to a person who has many, many neighbors, then effectively you're affording indirect protection from that person to many of their neighbors. Of course, they have other neighbors as well, but the idea is if many of such folks are vaccinated, then the chance that one of the neighbors get infected actually falls drastically. And that's what we observe in our computer code. So I will uh, start closing with some closing remarks. I want to get back to this concept of P-cubed analytics again. I think uh, we are at a stage where P-cubed analytics for contagions are actually possible. I've given you some examples. I think that devices and apps can be made where you can be given real-time information on your phone about 
how uh, how uh, spread out how, how how contagious the disease might be which areas might be much more infected than others which areas you might want to avoid whether your risk would be higher by going to one place or other uh, you might get through information through contact tracing all this can be personalized and can be made precise i think this is important uh, not just for this contagion but for other contagions as well so let me close by a few important remarks that are very general and i think they are important in this context of of, of, of this uh, seminar and seminar series one is that we think that ai driven models or computing models such as the ones i described can actually provide meaningful solutions to problems in pandemic science but you have to work very closely with stakeholders and you have to build these models that are explainable and transparent there has been a lot of debate whether the models were right or wrong uh, often times and models are al always wrong as we know uh, very well known quote uh, but but hopefully one can understand where they go wrong and improve it uh, but they have to be useful as as the quote says one when you build models like this and systems like this you need to be agile and flexible because as you've all seen every day is different in the in this period of pandemic and if you build a tool and think that this is exactly what's going to happen the rest of the time then you are unfortunately wrong you need to adapt your tools and systems to the constant changes on the ground to adapt to behaviors and policies and how the pandemic changes its course one of the things i have found is unusual effectiveness of transdisciplinary science which is done in teams i think if you want to work on problems like this that are very large you should try and work in large teams and teams that have people with different skills the last two problems i think are significantly important one the social political economic considerations while studying pandemics is just as important as the disease itself and i would argue in many ways is more important because in a in an ideal world everybody can be told to go home stay there for a month and you can shut down the disease that can't be done Uh, and we have seen on the net information misinformation campaigns political issues that have come up governance issues that have come up uh, all of them have effectively uh, decide, you know influence how we as society try and control this particular pandemic uh, communicating our scientific results in such situation needs to be done very thoughtfully and be deliberate we as scientists and decision makers have a responsibility to tell the the larger public uh, you know what the results mean and be transparent about it uh, and this is something i do feel concerned about because after covid started so many people started doing modeling and all for good reasons and intentions but often times models were simply wrong but it's very hard when you have so many models for laymen to understand what 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 a right model and wrong model might be and so it's really something that we need to figure out how to communicate our results better and the last part that i want to close with is if you think pandemics were a big problem and it is it's a significant problem which is going to alter our society for years to come i think it's really just a warning shot in a certain sense at least in the case of pandemic we know that it will we can control it through pharmaceutical means and at least get it down to numbers that are acceptable to us in a few years if not less but climate change which is on the horizon and all of us agree is is something that we might not be able to change once it goes in, in, in into play might have larger uh, in, in challenges for us to work as a society and the effect of it on global systems might be significantly larger than the pandemic so i hope that we take lessons that we've learned from this pandemic and try to work together because just like pandemics climate change they do not obey national boundaries these are all agnostic to countries but as you heard in one of the previous talks very nicely uh, said where these national boundaries become important when decisions are being made although these phenomena climate change uh pandemics really are agnostic to the boundaries that are human made boundaries but decisions are always done with with national perspective in mind or state perspective in mind 
And that's the problem that we need to really try and overcome in the coming years. So with that, let me close. I want to thank the organizers again for an amazing job. I've heard most of the lectures by now. Uh, I really, I hope, and I'm going to tell others on my team to hear. I find this very, very fascinating piece of work that you folks have done. So thank you very much. Have a good evening. Wow. Thank you very much, Madhav. This has been a fantastic lecture. Um, I, as you proceeded, uh, as you began and as you proceeded to close, I was asking myself, you know, okay, so I, I can mention this and I can mention this. Now I understand why, because you've actually heard through all the lectures and you were, you've been able to connect. I think it's an organizer's dream to have the penultimate lecture in a lecture series that addresses and connects back to 21 lectures that took place before it. So I want to really thank you for doing that work for us because, you know, uh, the first time we organized a public lecture series was uh, during Submerge, which was our earlier uh, full exhibition season. Um, we had 15 lectures then because, the, you know, while water is a critical matter, it's not quite the same thing as living through the pandemic as we are doing now and so you know the, the terror is in a sense in our face and so we, we the goal then is the same as it is now which is to identify the object of inquiry and how it is addressed across disciplines so how do specialists who spend decades doing their research bring their expertise to unravel a phenomenon or an idea or an object of inquiry and for those who have the time wherewithal at their own pace to go through all of the lectures in, a, in many ways begin to understand how different disciplines ask questions of the same object of inquiry how they arrive at different kinds of knowledge about the self same thing and why that might you know allow us even if we don't belong to that uh, to either of those disciplines right like the, the 15 or the 23 in this case we understand the primacy of question, identifying the right kind of question as the beginning of a journey into making knowledge, into you know, creating knowledge uh, or producing artistic expressions or even exhibitions as we saw in the case of Sabrina Schultz who spoke yesterday about the Smithsonian's outbreak and the work that Anthony Fauci brought to that uh, you know, making of that exhibition. It's a very humbling thing to learn that you know, um, it takes, it takes all kinds of knowledge and you know it speaks to your point about transdisciplinary knowledge it takes a range of skills and a range of knowledge making practices to come together in order to address an issue and so i'm, I'm really grateful for you having done that because um done that, that that connecting work because now i i don't have to do this um so you know i'm going to i mean uh, so please put your questions in the q a box and i'll i'll misuse my privilege and ask you a first few uh, questions already while our audience uh, also gets to uh, you know I have, I, have, I have a couple of questions maybe three if i uh, you know if i'll ask a third later in the last slide you identified infodemics climate change urbanization amr synthetic passive pathogens you know as as sort of the the um, other looming crises and where this kind of work you know, then becomes useful. The, the ability to identify interactions, the ability to identify networks, and then there from to work towards um, shaping behavior in order to address these questions. Um, so what I'm going to what I'm going to ask you is as follows: how do we, I mean, how how is it that no, how do you? understand transmission in context because this is something we've tried to do in the exhibition also that we've looked at behavior emotion and disease um also ideas actually so behavior and ideas will kind of club together so how does how do you understand transmission in context what do we stand to gain from this comparison by what do i mean by comparison how do infodemics, climate change, urbanization, EMR, synthetic pathogens, etc., compare to each other in terms of not necessarily the specifics, but how do we learn from this cluster of different things uh, to understand the spread of ideas and, there, and there, therefore influence, influence then the spread of behavior? So I'll stop at that and let you answer that, and then we can take up the next question. Okay. Uh, 
I, if I understand your question right, first of all, John, we thank you very much for for such kind words. Um, I'm I'm really in, I enjoyed the 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 talks, and so it was easy for me to listen. Folks did a good job, uh, and the speakers were just uh, outstanding. So, I want to answer the question that you raised in in two parts. One is, I did not have enough time today to show, but really, when I showed you the spread of diseases on a network. Yeah. What we really have in these computer models are multiple such networks. There's a network for transmission of the disease. There's another network for potentially transmission of uh, information that people actually consume because that's affecting their final behavior. There's a network on which economic activity might happen and so on and so forth. Just as a, a way of example, particular problem we are studying right now is a coupling of two kinds of networks, one on which the disease spread and one on which the usage of masks might spread. So in, in this, you know, masks usage is really dependent on how people, how pro-social they might be, uh, how fearful they might be, uh, what sort of peer pressure they might have and their strategic behavior. They might decide, you know, everybody else is wearing, why should I wear it? So this interaction between these two networks are being studied because that's what is needed to finally understand where the epidemic would sort of proceed. That's at one level. At the macro level, you asked a very important question. What are sort of common features between studying say epidemics to studying you know, power outages to studying infodemics and so on and so forth. So my view is that the common denominator in all of this is the unifying mathematical principles of networks that really allows us to study it. Mm. What might, and we have actually written other papers, my colleagues are online and during the discussion section, session, we can describe this, where what we have tried to build a mathematical and computational theory is, is saying that what really matters is to understand this in a fairly generic manner. The specific details oftentimes are not so important but the general structure of the network, the general form of behavior governs the process. How it comes about could be essentially ignored for at least certain class of questions. So that's how you actually couple these things into one. So I hopefully gives you a reasonable answer, one within a phenomena itself, and one, I would say across phenomena. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was, that was interesting. I've, I've noted down a few phrases. Um, and hopefully I'll come back to you with some other questions. I'll, I'll ask you Mark Pizzato's question, who says that he's heard that with COVID recovered people can still pass on the virus. What sort of, so what, what was that a part of your model? Sorry. I heard that with COVID recovered people can still pass on the virus. Was that part of your model for it? Unlike the traditional SIR types in your presentation. Right. So, of course, it, de it depends on what you call recovery, right? Mm -hmm. There's a period from uh, where one might sense that somebody is recovered, but in terms of their ability to transmit, they might not have recovered. Our model is a statistical model. When the person reaches the recovered state in our model, they are indeed in a recovered form. But the question mark asks is important. And when the person is in infectious state, we can mm -hmm. allow that their ability to infect others to be a time varying uh, value, which then allows you to slowly decay the amount, uh, amount of uh, pathogen that they can transmit to their neighbors. So yes, that is being accounted for, but it's accounted for in a statistical manner. We, we as scientists still don't understand what sort of viral loads are needed, when exactly people might become uh, rec you know, be called recovered and so on and so forth. So yes, it's represented, but maybe somewhat approximately. Okay. The next question is from Prem Chandavarkar. He would like to know, how do you build an effective digital model in a country like India, where the availability of data tends to be disaggregated, not uniform in quality or reliability, and is often incomplete? So Mr. Chandavarkar, great question. Um, I actually, attempted to do this in India. So I will tell you a few success stories and few challenges. Um, back in 2011 or so, we started to build a digital twin for uh, parts of India. And mm -hmm. we decided to focus on Delhi first and then Mumbai. It was very, very hard as you rightly pointed out, data was just not available, but we were able to actually finally 
build out a digital twin for both the cities. And we focused on Delhi much more. In fact, uh, we had representations where we got data from for slums. We understood how slums were organized in Mumbai as well. And we did some interesting analysis of the role of these low income neighborhoods on the disease itself. Uh, back in, and the papers show this, that was done in the context of influenza. Now, over time, data has become more and more available. I think that at this point of time, a coarser representation of India is certainly possible. It might not be as detailed frame as the representation in US, but coarser models will still suffice uh, for certain class of questions. And we have, in a month or so, we will release our first representation of India. My colleagues in IASC actually have built a representation of Bangalore, very nicely done work by Rajesh Seva and others. Uh, I think their colleagues at TIFR have built a similar digital twin for uh, Mumbai. And, and Gautam Menon is also building a digital twin for cities like Pune. So there is already attempts. Uh, the details would of course differ, but I, in fact, I view this as actually an interesting question and I'll turn it around. I'll say the desire to build this then forces scientists to ask for data to be cleaned up and be made available through government agencies. So I think that building this would have tremendous use, not just for diseases, Mr. Chandavakar, but understanding how to build, let's say if you're from Pune, uh, then where to put the subway and what sort of lines that subway lines would, would support. All these questions can actually be said. Funnily enough, we built a digital twin first, not for epidemiology, but in 1994, when we first started doing this work, we did this for studying urban transport system. And I have actually articulated the need for doing this in Pune for a long time. Uh, my parents live in Kothrud or used to live in Kothrud. And I was arguing that they should build uh, a metro, metro line right across the road. They finally are doing it, not because of me, of course, but uh, I think it's, the, the same become much clearer over time. So I have three questions from Bitu. I'm going to take them one by one so that it's yeah. just um, uh, easier to manage. What are the main limiting factors for this set of techniques? Is it computing power, data availability, or perhaps current theoretical frameworks? Uh, I think the computing power, uh, because it's never enough for a computer scientist. We are all hungry for more and more. We're also hungry for more and more data, but I think computing, I think if we harness the computing that is around, mm -hmm. it might actually, be adequate for for a current time. We can do much better with more computing, right? Uh, data, we can certainly do better with more data. And one hand, a lot of data exists, but on the other hand, very limited data also exists. It's a, it's a hard question. It seems we are drowning in data on one hand, but if you look at very specific data that is not available. Uh, and the models themselves need to be need to be improved. Let me put two interesting points. I think you raise a really important question that motivates me to give this answer. One, as when we first did OD models, certain class of data and computing power was needed. When we started building models such as the one I described, we need new classes of data sets and new power on the computing side and new theoretical understanding. We are actually moving in another direction where I've described to you growth of this a digital twin outside the body, if you want to call it. But we're starting to build a similar digital twin for within the body. Cells, understanding the immune response itself, because we think that that's important to study vaccines, your immune response when you get infected. And you can imagine the level of computing and the class of models and the kinds of data that would be needed to couple within body models that are that detailed and outside body models that are detailed. So, that, so this growth continues to happen on one side. The second side is that decision maker drives this problem a lot. What do I mean by that? If you look at the trading in, on the stock market, uh, hmm. certainly in the US and in India as well, trading used to be done by you, you know, you, you know, people on the floor and people used to shout and, and trade. Now it's all algorithmic trading. And algorithmic trading has implied newer models, faster computers to the extent that generally big companies, trading companies are trying to buy real estate very close to the New York Stock Exchange because even the small delay in terms of maybe microseconds on the wire that it takes 
can essentially change the arbitrage possibilities or create ones in 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 some sense so what i what do i say from that the desire by the decision makers or analysts to get faster and faster and more and more pervasive decisions are de making that's why the pq brand analytics is important so the desire more data becomes available the data becomes pervasive you build models that are giving you certain amount of precise and pervasive decisions uh, capability that actually speeds up things so you act on it your actions actually might change the system so you might need to compute further so this is a interesting loop which i think keeps on where this desire to get faster and faster solution just keeps increasing so i don't have a perfect answer where this will stop maybe as a computer scientist that tells me that my job will be secure for a period of time to come uh, you know we are, we are not going to see a, a stability in the system where there's nothing to do for all you know mathematicians computer scientists and policy makers Wonderful. So this reminds me of a piece that was written by um, a senior colleague of mine in science and technology studies called Donald McKenzie. And I've pasted the link to the article for all of us to see where um, he talks about how, you know, that the he's, he's looked at how accuracy is arrived at, you know, in decisions ac across sort of stakeholders. And his first work, which was useful for me earlier on, was about how missile accuracy was arrived at, right? Like, when would you say that a missile is hit accurately? And, you know, the expanse has gone from like kilometers to you know and become sort of you know uh, smaller and smaller but how is that even understood and you know is it like is it is it a value you capture because it has hit in a particular way or you know is it something you actually work towards and decide it's whether it's going to happen or not and he has written a wonderful article in the london review of books about the five second trading gap that you just spoke about right like so this is a this is just another way of understanding that right? like how that consensus was arrived at so please for those of you who are interested uh, at all do have a look um i will ask the second question uh is there work being done to model microeconomic consequences of pandemic mitigation measures for example lockdown induced job loss influencing susceptibility to infection uh, great question so actually our paper is in a review uh, we've done just that whether it's at a very microscopic scale uh, i would say no but it's something that needs to be done but our first paper uh, which appears in nature scientific reports computes the economic cost due to infections just the, the economic direct what they call the direct impact of the pandemic that is number of infections uh, number of you know hospitalizations and the cost of treating mortality and uh, because of mortality you know the, the 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 number of years basically of productive life that you've lost and its impact secondary and tertiary effects that if somebody is hospitalized for a while they might not go to uh, to work or if they die then they cannot work and as a result uh, in a, in an economy when you have sectors and then the fall in, in in production one sector might affect another sector this we coupled a, a relatively simple model called the io model in in economics and coupled that to the epidemic model and we have done some projections for for us where we have shown a significant economic impact of the pandemic now this paper was written almost 6 months ago so the numbers would have to change so we come up came up with a scenario so we had some possibility that we studied but a question is well taken to take it down to micro level where you want to look at particular city i think if the data is made available then certainly this question is within reach of analyst because you can actually couple them a micro model at a level of a city for instance look at the businesses look at their overall turnover see how many people might go back and forth the model by yuri leskovic and serena on which i actually described the tool was actually beautifully done model using safe graph data for the us they took at 10 cities in the country 100 million people and they are able to capture the flows on an hourly basis from the data from a census block group which is basically a set of blocks a small area like a pin code in india to points of interest and the points of interest are fairly detailed you know you might come down to a shopping plaza you know it might not come to one particular kirana store or one particular uh, swimming pool but within 
say a hundred meter range, you, the, that's the point of interest in mark for anonymity and privacy reasons, of course, the pings have more information. So from that, you can actually start understanding how the flows that they have computed can ebb and increase in time with different interventions and then use that to compute economic costs. So absolutely doable uh, and a question that we should all uh, undertake because I think that's a big driver, isn't it? Much of the decisions that were being taken are taken because the view is that, oh, we need to open up a business because the losses are uh, not uh, manageable. Of course, I feel that's a false dichotomy because every society that has actually controlled the disease first has always come out to a winner and has recovered economically much better than letting it play out. And Bittu's last question. What kind of value does privacy preserving contact tracing add to the underlying network dynamics? Is there a tipping point after which the predictive ability grows rapidly? It's a good question. Great question, absolutely great question. I think contact tracing apps are very useful. They of course have questions about uptake, as you point out. They have issues about uh, privacy, but I think I am very confident that the apps that Google and Apple built are, uh, you know, they're privacy preserving. Uh, they really don't reveal much of any information at all beyond very basic. Uh, the contact tracing app, when enough people use it, is, and if they use it pervasively all the time, right, uh, would be. Absolutely superb. Now, for because of lack of Bluetooth availability, power on the machines, many things happen. But we have seen in even the case of Waze, for instance, right, that people use for us understanding traffic. Google has Waze that basically uses pings to study traffic on, on the road. You don't need everybody to use a contact tracing app to get reasonable estimates. The general number is 30 to 40 percent. Uh, but that's a large number. And the number of course will depend on how dense the populations are and how frequently they're using. So maybe the question between you're asking is uh, to be reframed and I don't think so I have a very good answer. And maybe it's a question people should take up is at any given point of time as this disease goes, how many devices should be active? And do we, can we work with, you know, one person keeping the device active all the time while many others just shutting it down that will give you an, hours. So if you compute the activity in number of hour, total hours, do you mm. split it across individuals or you only consider total? Which one is, is a better way to do it? I do not have a good answer. I don't think so. We know, but we have done studies. The group in England has done studies. A lot of people have done contact tracing studies. What we certainly know is at this level in US, the apps have not been that successful. On the other hand, apps have been very successful in other countries, I'm told, such as South Korea, in in China where people are mandated to use it much more effectively. Uh, mm -hmm. In China and other places, the government is also required to share much more information. And that's another question that societies have decided, how much information do you want to share to that? So I think they are very useful. This is a decision that should be made as a society during peacetime so that when events happen, we are not scrambling to define the laws. And maybe just like emergency use authorization, you might say things have to be quiet, but when things like this happen, people should be willing to share a little bit more information. How much more? That will, of course, depend on each country and society. Uh, that's that's really a, a wonderful answer. Um, you know, um, would I be right in understanding that this is in some way an attempt to pre-engineer sampling um, for data collection? Um, yes, so getting it real time so that we can actually get... I also showed you the example of vaccine allocation. You can also use it for contact tracing. Another use for it, Janavi, uh, and to Bitu's question is, let's say the if you couple your device with other information such as Apple Watch has right now, which might actually tell you that you might be falling sick, you might have fever, you might, you know, heart rate is able to predict some aspects of it. Yeah. Maybe you can self quarantine a little earlier. Maybe you go to the hospital and give your blood sample and you can get genotyping, which I think would be super cool to try and understand new variants that are arising. I think if you want to do good biosurveillance, genomic surveillance, mm -hmm. contact tracing can actually be very, very useful. When as soon as you think somebody has become come close to an individual who is not well, they can go and try and provide, you know, take 
at least samples at home you know nowadays home kits are available if they show up symptomatic they can then go and work with a genomic sampling place which can actually understand what sort of variants they might have because we have seen in india one of the biggest reasons that this this played out in, in india the way it did uh, for, apart from social reasons is that we have a delta variant that is clearly now established itself to be much more virulent mm -hmm. and uh, i would say um, uh, much more problematic than the wild type that was available before so understanding the spread of variants and their prevalence could be another use of these contact tracing apps wonderful and i, I think um, it's what what is worth remembering from the from the answers that you've just given is that the this consensus or this debate in a sense needs to happen during peacetime uh, because this isn't the last pandemic we've had from everything that we've learned in you know by talking to experts but also this isn't only about pandemics this is about the various kinds of social crises that you know or planetary crises that we stand to face for which we might want to you know debate and get ready express our willingness to share the kind of data that we want to and arrive at um, a better you know a better orchestrated um, uh, regulation and mechanisms that will help mitigate but if not mitigate manage situations when they do happen so thank you very very much for taking the time to be with us this morning for you and this evening for us um for those of you who have had the privilege to hear Madhav talk this evening uh, and would like to share it with your colleagues and friends and students. Uh, the talk will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. And in case you've missed any of the previous lectures that Madhav spoke about, do please check out the channel. Uh, there are 22, uh, well, 21 at this moment, other lectures that are available to listen. I'd especially recommend Gautam's, uh, Gautam Menon's lecture that Madhav also mentioned on why and how should we model infectious disease and Damon Centola's lecture on the network dynamics of social change. Um, in the exhibition, uh, I would encourage you to uh, check out the simulation by Dirk Brockman, uh, who's a physicist at the Robert Koch Institute, which is part of the exhibit Contagion in the 21st Century. Um, and a silent reminder, this is the closing weekend of phase one of Contagion. So do please take time to, air, to explore these specific exhibits, which will be gone after June 13, which is tomorrow, which is a cluster of 17 cases by Blast Theory, which explores the events um, in the Metropole Hotel in Hong Kong, where the first cluster of SARS cases were detected in 2003. And there are five films, fairly short ones, which you can watch uh, a human question uh, about the HIV, um, pandemic, This Ease by the artist uh, Miriam Ghani, Survivors about the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, A Periwig Maker, and Where Birds Dance Their Last, um, which is about uh, ducks, uh, uh, farmers who raise ducks for trading with, uh, trading their feathers with China. These are all films in our film series, uh, part of our film series, so do please have a look and wait for our announcement about what we will be doing in phase two uh, in late July. Do give us your feedback, it'll keep us on track, register for the remaining programs and visit the exhibition site. Thank you again, Madhav, for taking the time to be with us this evening, for the wonderful connections that you drew to the lectures and exhibits that are already there. And we look forward to future conversations with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the opportunity again. And as I understand, we'll have this uh, discussion with a smaller set Yes. At, at uh, 10.30, correct. And I look forward to talking. So, But thank you again. What a wonderful series that you folks have organized. Congratulations to you all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all and have a lovely evening.